welcome to the Retro Blood. Welcome back, everybody, to the Retro Blood. As we continue this New York killer, stalker, blood, lights, deadly horror month, talking some wild 1980s movies all surrounding the New York area with the bright lights, the blood. I always fuck it up. Was it the bright lights, the bigger city, the blood? Bright lights, big city, red blood. That's what it is. Yeah. Man, we make a shirt of that. You know what I mean? There you go. Well, I mean, maybe it would help you remember it. It's true. <laughs> Anything on a shirt you or a wear logo? the shirt all the time. Maybe I should use it for my <laughs> coaster, for my beer. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I remember from there. <laughs> up next, if y'all like detective work, if y'all like. Uh, what kind of if y'all like a uh, a younger 35 I think you said he was 33 something like that news reporter who's making a name for himself being on channel 6 talking killers who handcuffed victims and pools and elevators and all kinds of stuff if y'all like some uh, random chick who can like draw deadly draw the killer's uh, actions all through her paintings that are kind of like block what do you call those ink blocks that's what it kind of looked like to me okay. um, if y'all like uh, uh, one detective named Weeks who has a bunch of weak jokes then this is going to be the review for you brother because the retro blood is talking all about the clairvoyant alright aka um, what was it? AKA The Killing Hour. The Killing Hour, yep. J.H. Allison, James Klein, what's up, Allison? How has your, uh, how has your stay in New York City been with a new Son of Sam killer out there handcuffing people and killing them in all kinds of crazy ways? How's it been? Well, well, I mean, the Son of Sam didn't handcuff people, but still um yeah it's a new killer. but uh, the uh that's a new killer right the um, handcuff killer i thought this month started off really well and now it's kind of going downhill a little bit so <laughs> i don't know um uh, this one was manhattan a... baby last week oh, and then oh. we had this this week um yeah. i don't know i mean i'm not saying i didn't like this movie it wasn't terrible it was it was okay so I'm not exactly sure what to think about this film because we've seen and we've done films like this before on the Retro Blood. Yeah. You know, like the Dario Argento, you know, what are it, Gallio films? Is that, I'm saying that right? Gallo. Gall- 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 I think it's Gallo. Gallo yeah. films. Th- those are basically kind of like this where we have a mystery killer and yeah. throughout the whole movie we're trying to, you know, solve the mystery of this killer and we have, you know, different detectives or different people in the uh, the spider web of the old uh, uh, killer. And this movie yeah. is very similar to that, but I just think the uh, the Italians just just do it a little better. You know what I mean? Just uh, Yeah, which is ironic because the guy that directed this is Italian, exactly. but he's not like an Italian filmmaker. Yes. Um, I kind of thought the same thing. Like this reminded me of like almost like they were trying to make an American Giallo film but it just wasn't very good. Yeah. I mean, it's not bad. It's just like, I didn't really get, I didn't understand it. Like I, at first, the first time I watched it, I was like, I, you know, am I missing something here? Yeah. Um, then I watched it. I watched it one and a half times. I didn't watch it all the way to the end the second time. Um, it's okay. I mean, it, it's, I just found it the first half of it, especially extremely boring. Um, yeah. And then it gets a little bit better at the end. So I thought the, uh, the way the killer, you know, uh, you know, there was, it made sense at the end why the person was killing everybody. You know what I mean? We got yeah. to figure that out. No, not too much of a mystery there. I thought some of the ways that he killed the people were pretty freaky, uh, especially the water guy. Oh yeah, that and, was terrifying. Yeah, but we'll get there oh, in a minute. God. Um, but uh, yeah, I think the, the the actual film, like some of it, I wouldn't say like. It's like it made sense, but it didn't make sense at the same time for some of the right. stuff. And 
it just uh, something like the little like I think some I think the overall story was you know fine, but I think some of the little details in the actual story were just a little confusing. But we'll talk about all that. Here, we will on here, but yeah, I don't know. When it comes to the uh, the murder mystery, I kind of like the uh, the other Italian way to do them. Like you know, the more close ups on the black leather mystery, the more close ups on the uh, the aesthetics. You know, that's probably what was missing in this film. It wasn't very like eye pleasing when it comes to, like your lights and you know things oh, right. like that. Yeah, you know, but you know, and it had like maybe it was and it was also like that character weeks. I don't know. I just did. I wasn't mm-hmm. buying him. Like has like the hero of the story guy. Like uh, with his dumb impressions and stuff. I was like, oh god. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, I don't. Under, I mean, I think that that's just something that may be lost in time. Like maybe that was funny in 1982. I guess. But it's just annoying now. Like I don't know. You didn't like his uh, uh, all his impressions there, Austin. His comedy routine. This, all right. I mean, well, I mean, in 1982, it would have made more sense. But like he's talking about doing a George, a George Burns impression. Sure. And I would imagine that most people don't even know who George Burns is because in 1982, George Burns was like 80 years old. Yeah. Well, you know, he's up to date with his uh, references on 1982. At least. <laughs> all right. I guess so. But we'll talk all about it, everybody. The clairvoyant. Or the killing hour. Which one do you like better, the clairvoyant or the killing hour? I like the clairvoyant better because the killing hour doesn't make any sense. Well, I don't know why they killed they him in an hour. Oh, well, okay, good point. Good point. I mean, did, did, so, did, did any of the killings actually happen within one hour? I, I don't no think idea. so. I mean, the only reason it's called the killing hour is because when uh, Bill Lustig, who we talked about a couple of weeks ago, directing Maniac, released it on his Blue Underground label, he changed the name of it to the killing hour. Yeah. Instead of the clairvoyant for some reason. But it was released in the United States as the clairvoyant. And it was released in France as the clairvoyant. Which I find really weird because, like, the only people that are going to buy this are people that saw it on VHS originally, right? So in 2008, when he put it out on Blu-ray, the people that would have bought this would have been the people who watched it in 1984 when it was released as a clairvoyant, but you're selling it under a different title. So it doesn't make any sense. Um, like I couldn't even find it because remember you told me it was on Tubi, which is where yeah. we ended, ultimately watched it, but I had to look it up under the killing hour to watch it. So I don't know. I don't know why they change names like that when they don't need to, especially if it doesn't have a historical name that was changed later. I can understand changing it back like with the Dario Argento film phenomena that we did in the archives. Um, it was when it was brought to America, it was called creepers. So, but when they released it here, they changed it back to phenomena. Cause that's what it, the movie was called. I understand that, but I just don't understand why he would change the title to something that nobody would recognize. Yeah. Very but interesting. Anyway. I don't know. Maybe just like, maybe, maybe he couldn't, um, what do you, what do you say? Like he couldn't, uh, get the rights. To the clairvoyant, to the name. maybe maybe it was know. our maybe it was our boy Iron Maiden, or that stopped him, brother, from taking. I the wonder name. if the print that he could get, the negative that he could get to make his Blu-ray, mm-hmm. had the Killing Hour um, title, yeah. and he couldn't he couldn't get a print that said the clairvoyant, so he just changed the name. I be, I bet you that's what it was. Yeah, because that would have been too confusing for people who did buy it. Yeah, they would return it thinking they bought the got the wrong movie. Uh, I gar- I bet you that's it. I bet you that he just could not get a print that said the clairvoyant or couldn't find one. So he, cause this movie's pretty rare anyway, you know, and when you're trying to release a movie like that on Blu-ray, you, you try to get the best quality print you can get. And the, probably the best quality print he could get said the killing hour. But yeah, anyway, you got that right, man. Speaking of the best quality you can get, let's get into our weekly October fest. Beers of the week. All right, Allison. I went first last week, so now it's your turn. What Oktoberfest are you gracing us with today? This week, um, I am partaking in High Wires Zirkus <laughs> Fest Oktoberfest Martin Lager. Oh, nice! I saw that one. It's like in a yellow can. 
than a yellow can and it's like a it's like a 16 ounce can so it doesn't fit in any pint glass that you want yep um but yeah it's super convenient to drink i like it um but luckily i have a dimple glass that it'll fit in um but this is a i like this beer a lot i like high wire beer i think the, yes. the, the high wire guys make good beer um they are gonna be this one's they're gonna be uh they're gonna actually gonna be a highly talked about company when it comes to our winter beers because yes. those guys they they pull out some great stouts they do they make good stouts at highwire yes Highwire is a good company very good um yes. check them out for everybody. a big for a for a big company like that i mean they're local to us but they've stretched all over the world i mean they're now Al- not in the world but they're in alabama they've got a you know a tap room in uh cincinnati so they're stretching out and uh getting big and uh I wish them all the success in the world, but they do make good beer still. Yes. Good guys. So, how does it taste over there? Oh, it's good. Um, <laughs> that's the most important thing, right? Talk about the what taste. a review! Yeah, like five the, stars, um, there, Allison. Oh, it's good. No, it's it's definitely a five star beer. I love the <laughs> uh, Circus Fest. It's very, um, it's malty, which is what I like in a beer. Um, not too hoppy. It's very. It's really. How would I describe it? It's not real dark. I mean, you, it's kind of a, it's a dark for a lager, of course, but it's like a, you know, it's it's got that amber color that I like in a beer. Um, yeah, I like Zirkus Fest a lot. So go out and buy it, Zirkus Fest. If you can get it where you are, drink it. Drink it, everybody. All right. So mine is um, a little interesting over here, and I actually got a backstory to it a little bit too. So you know, in kayfabe, because that's what we do over here, brother. As mm-hmm. in, uh, shoot, you know, we were supposed to record this last night, but, uh, I had to, you know, I was basically, I was out visiting some friends that took a little longer than I expected, which, you know, what happens. Um, so we went to the, uh, to, to the Greenville, South Carolina and, right. you know, our first, we were going to meet up and we had like two options. We were either going to eat at this German restaurant. Or we found there's actually this restaurant out here. It's mm-hmm. it's it's in here in Atlanta, and they're kind of growing a little bit. And it's kind of a unique restaurant in a way, and kind of unique. Um, but it's basically a restaurant that's owned, and uh, I don't know, if it's, I don't know if it's operated, but it's pretty much owned by uh, <laughs> Daryl. Uh, what's the name? You know, Norman Reedus and Greg oh, Nicotero. Yeah. The uh, yeah. yeah, the Walking Dead guy. The well, two, I know yeah. him from Boondock Saints, but yes, yes, he's yeah, most yeah. famous, I guess, now from <clears throat> Walking Dead. Yeah, Norman, Reed, you know, Boondock Saints. He was in that movie, you know, mm-hmm. Walking Dead, and he's, I, I think he's supposed to be the new Venom too. That I heard. Really? Yeah. Oh yeah, he plays Null. No, yes. Yeah, he plays so Null. That's be interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then, of course, Greg and Nicotero, which we talk about on the show all the time. You know, we talked about him on uh, Day of the Dead and a lot of the zombie movies. Uh, he was, yep. you know, obviously he was on Creep Show. He helped out with the Creep Show as well too. So they actually had, the, they own their own restaurant, and they have Is a couple location. No, themed? it's just called okay. like it's called like, <laughs> God, it's like, it's a weird. It's like just like their last names and shit. It's like uh, Nick and Nick and just, uh, let me pull it up over here. Nick and Norman. <laughs> yeah, Nick and Norman. Yeah, I think it's like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you got it. It's like Nick and Norman. That's their restaurant. Okay. All right. And <clears throat> we went there. And the food's okay. It's basically like kind of like bar food in a way, even though they do have some specialized burgers that I, I don't ever, I haven't really seen those kind of before. I I didn't want a burger that yesterday. I just had like their uh, turkey burger, which was fine. Yeah, of course, um, uh, fried pickles were good as well too. Uh, but I was looking on the beer list, and I was like, "Where is your Oktoberfest?" And they're like, "Well, we don't carry that." And I was like, "Oh God, okay, strike one." But uh, I'm just kidding. It's all right. Not all the all the bars are gonna have Oktoberfest. I had, I just had me a sour that was pretty good. The restaurant was mm-hmm. fine. And everything it was kind of cool in there. Like you could see like different. Um, there's like it's it's the the location we went to in Greenville was very fancy. I had like a chandelier and everything. Very nice tables. Oh, nice. Uh, I think they took over from a different restaurant that used to be there before. And they but just had a chandelier. They had like I it might have already had all the stuff in there, but it looks like they just <laughs> took it over, made it a little like cleaner, and they put yeah. a bunch of posters of uh, uh um Norma Reedus and Greg Nicotero like backstage with each other. Like there's a bunch of po- like rare posters of them all over the place. Okay. So 
Is it uh, <clears throat> as good or better than uh, the other Greenville restaurant we went to, which was Twin Peaks? Uh, no. I, uh, okay. I'm a big Twin Peaks fan. Mm-hmm. All right. Their avocado smash burger is great. It is good. Their beer filled up to the top because they cold out their glasses, too. Uh, I've always been a fan, a fan of Twin Peaks. This one, this one's more like a specialty kind of bar. You know what I mean? Like their their stuff is like a little bit more rare. Mm-hmm. But it was good though. It was good. Uh, but then afterwards, then we went to this German uh, restaurant in Greenville. All right. Okay. And I was like, because I wanted to basically what I wanted to do was I was trying to do is trying to find like a specialty Oktoberfest to do for this review. Okay. Sure. So I was like, well, fuck. I mean, if I go to a German bar and restaurant, maybe I could buy me an Oktoberfest. You know what I mean? You're maybe. thinking German bar, you go in there. No, they didn't have any. They're like, oh, well, Oktoberfest doesn't happen until the 25th. I was like, what? Well, I mean, that's true, but you would think they would maybe start their uh, yeah. selling of their beer early, but I guess not. Nope, nope. So we went over there. I had me this uh, lighter German beer and stuff, and then uh, mm-hmm. it was okay, but... You know, I was staying out late and everything, catching up with some old friends and everything. But then, uh, when I got home, I know you know we couldn't do the podcast that night because I got home too late. But I did end up buying on my way back home an Oktoberfest to have. Oh, the finally, talk about. do we get to the story? Okay, so now so that's how we get there. This, <laughs> so that's how we get Lord the of the Rings esque story about exactly. how we got to the Oktoberfest. So tell us about it. I'm kind of like uh, remember last review with our boy Tommy where he goes on travels. You know, that we don't see? Yes. You know, remember my, yeah, remember my hand, baby, he goes on all these travels that we just don't see, we just hear about them? That's that's what exactly. I'm doing on this show. Okay. I'm just talking about my travels that none of you see at all. <laughs> and that's how I got this 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 beer called Lazy Hiker. All right. Beering Company, their Oktoberfest lager. All right. And I actually have a description here, which is uh, funny. This copper colored marzen lager has been waiting patiently in our cellar for the perfect moment to make its interest into your hearts this is awesome. like this is like me reading like the the the, uh, the description for some of these movies <laughs> yes it's like you're reading copy they gave you read so, this about our beer before refrigeration these german beers were beard in march and then stored cool in the caves to be brought out and drunk during the late summer and early fall Yep. We followed, cask beer. It's the best way. That's the way to do it, man. We follow tradition on this one, minus the caves, of course. Ha ha ha! This is like this is like our this is like um weeks weeks jokes right here. <laughs> okay, <laughs> those like fucking lame dad jokes that he does the whole movie. His uh, boomer jokes. Yeah. yeah, you'll notice a rich, toasty malt body that goes down smooth and finishes crisp. With just the right kiss of n- novel hop spice. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it was pretty good. It was okay. This is not my favorite Oktoberfest beer. Um, I would say it's like kind of like in the middle of the ones I've had this. Uh, eh, I mean, no, I I would say this is like compared to the ones that I've had. You know, when I talked about the one from Raleigh and the one from mm-hmm. uh, uh, last week, the one from um, uh, what's it called? Uh, Edmonds. A beering company and stuff. Edmonds Oast, yeah. Yeah, Shiner yeah. one. This is probably like on the list. I'm not the Lazy Hiker. They they make a lot of like specialized beer. They're they're a local uh, brand around here in Asheville. No, uh, they're from Silva, I think. Yeah, they're not bad, but it's just like I'm not the. the there hasn't been a beer out there that that's like uh, that's like grabbed me from them yet. Yeah. So here's the thing, and I'm going to say something controversial that are going to piss a lot of people off, especially locals, but. So, um, as some people may or may not know, I mean, you know, we're, we all live around the uh, Asheville, North Carolina area, um, which is Beer City, or was at one point. Um, there's like, you know, 50 breweries or whatever in town. Yeah. But the, my opinion on this is that now there's so many breweries that everyone thinks that they can be a brewer. Yeah. And so now there's so many breweries here that half of them aren't really making good beer. You know what I mean? It's just shit to sell to tourists. Yeah. Um, and not to say that Lazy Hiker's not good. I mean, I've had some of their beers that are good. Yeah. But, I mean, it's not something, it's not, they. I mean, you know, it, but, um, you know, I think that they, they in particular do make some beers that are good. But, like, I think that there's a lot of brewers down here that just aren't good. Um, and it's just standard shit. 
you yeah. know, make it, sell it to tourists. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, lots of exceptions, though. Yeah, you know, Highwire is great. Highland is still good, and you know, they're the biggest company in town. They're still good, um, but yeah, um, but yeah, that's some- my. Uh, that's my hot take, if you will, as the kids call it. Yeah. My but, unpopular opinion. Yeah. I mean, yeah, some of them are definitely like that. You know what I mean? When you have so many in the market, you know, it's hard to pick out. Um, You know, like, there is some out there that, like, I'm hit or miss on, too. Uh, the yeah. one beard over here in Waynesville, the Boojum. Like, I'm hit or miss on some of their beers. Like, there's some of them I, I almost, really like. There's some that I do. I almost got the Boojum Oktoberfest, but I got the... Uh, I got the high wire instead because i was thinking yeah. you might get the boojum one yeah um but yeah boojum i i, I the thing about boojum is and i mean this is going to be like a captain obvious kind of statement but the styles of beers that i like um to drink i think boojum does those well yeah like their stouts are good um but like you know i'm so sick of ipas that i don't ever want to drink an ipa again oh, yeah, now that's like the thing around um, here yeah, I mean, you can go around here. You can, well, it's it's anywhere now. You can go to a bar, and if they have twenty beers, fifteen of them will be diff- will be IPAs. Um, but you know, like like their IPAs, I don't particularly like. But I don't, I don't like anybody's IPAs um, that I've had um, anymore. So you know, I, I like Boojum a lot. But maybe we'll talk about Boojum one day when we try one of their beers. There you go. Might make it happen. But everybody, you know, check them out though. The High Wire, definitely check it out. That is definitely one of the beers. If you oh, ever yeah. see any of theirs, they, they definitely um, one of the high standards around here. Lazy Hiker, you know, it's not bad. If you see it in your local section, try it out. You know what I mean? It's still good. I still like it. Mm-hmm. So the the can isn't the most flashiest thing you'll see, but it's not the... Uh, not yellow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this one's like an orange, but they all have like the same font. Of like some guy hiking in the mountains, but they change yeah. like the font on each of them. So, mm-hmm. but check them out, everybody. Beer is beer sometimes, but then again, there's great beer out there. Mm-hmm. Speaking of great stuff, let's get into the history segment of what was happening in the world of the pro wrestling and the metal music around the release date of the Player Voyant October 24th, 1982 in France. Yes. So we would have to Very fly out to France to see the. I don't know what I would think if I actually flew out to France to watch this movie. Yeah, can you imagine? Like we flew to France and this is what we got. I was like, um, eh. yeah, this is only. It was only released in theatrically in France. Yeah. Um, yeah. This was this thing was not going to get released at all. Basically, Fox bought it and then put it out on video in the United States, but. It was basically not going to get released, period. It was it's strange. It has a strange history, which we'll get to. Speaking of a strange history, I am I picked out this metal song for this week. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I'm pretty sure this song has nothing to do with the movie. And it didn't even came out around the movie. But I thought it was a pretty fun coincidence. Because we do talk about this man all the time, especially Allison over here. And that is one Iron Maiden. Yep, my favorite band of all time. So on their album, which we have talked about multiple times, Seventh Son of a Seventh Son, they do have a a pretty popular song called The Clairvoyant. Mm Mm-hmm. All right. And this one did come out in 1988. All right. So some six years after the clairvoyant movie but you know in our history i would like to think that this song the clairvoyant basically talks about this movie um it makes you know about as much sense yes. but um but yeah the clairvoyant is um i mean like you said it's on seventh son of a seventh son which is pro until like until brave new world came out it's probably iron maiden's last great album um they definitely started like kind of going downhill after this album but this is considered one of their best albums um by most fans um it this song is interesting because they don't play it live very often um and i'm i was trying to think going into this if i'd ever seen this song perform live and i don't remember it but supposedly it was played on the fear of the dark tour 
which I did see in 1992 or three, whatever that was. So I did see that, but I don't remember them playing this, but that was a very long time ago, uh, many beers ago. Um, but they did play it again in 2008 on the um, uh, Somewhere Back in Time tour, but I didn't go to that one because the closest it came was like Baltimore, Maryland, and I couldn't go. Um, but yeah, so I haven't seen, if I have seen the Caravoyant live, it's been like 30 years since I've seen it. Um, and I feel like it's about time to bring that back because I listen to it again. Yeah. Because I don't listen to Seventh Son a lot. Seventh Son is a is a a uh, concept album where most of the songs, well, the ones that Steve Harris wrote, tell a story of a of a um, like a magical guy, and a clairvoyance part of that. Yes. Um, but I really like this song. Um, I like. Uh, um, I, I think it has a really good guitar solo. It's got a good chorus. Um, I think it's a great tune, and they should play it more often. What are your thoughts on the clairvoyant? And had you ever heard it before uh, we did the show? Uh, no, I haven't heard it. I've heard most of the song the, the songs off the Stedman song yeah. album because we talked about most of them. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I actually really liked the song. I thought it had a really good melody, and like you're saying, like very good vocals to it as well too. Uh, I actually yeah. thought it was a pretty fun song, and it it's, it looks like they used to play it a lot live, mostly when this when this um, album came out. But yeah, it looks when, like it the, new, yes. when it was new, yeah, when this, yeah, on the uh, Made in England tour, I think is what it was called, the yeah. uh, Seventh Son of the Seventh Son, or it's Seventh Tour of a Seventh Tour is what they called it at the time. Um, they um, they played it on that tour, and then they played it for a few years after that, up until about 93. And then I don't remember them playing it again. Although I never saw any of the tours with Blaze Bailey, so they may have played it during those tours as well um, in the late 90s. But yeah, it's a good tune. They should bring it back out. Yeah. They should, on this new tour, they should drop Can I Play With Madness and add the Clairvoyant because that would be a song from the same album, but a better song, if you will. Yeah, I definitely liked it. It was definitely fun. I'll try to play some of the... uh... The song or a video of the song on the on the YouTube on the uh, Facebook. I would say YouTube. It's on the Facebook. I'd be playing on it on there. Yeah, we can't play shit on the YouTube. Yeah, well, we can play our show on there. Shout out to all the Except YouTube our listeners. show. Our show is on the YouTube. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Shout out to everybody listening to us on the YouTube. Hopefully soon we can do some videos so you can see our lovely faces. That's in the works. Yeah. Speaking of in the works, according to Steve Harris. Mm-hmm. The song was inspired by the death of psychic Doris Stokes. Really? Okay. And his wondering if she were truly able to see the future. Well, not she had foreseen her own death. So basically like our movie. That's true. I forgot about that. I, I remember hearing that story. Um, uh, you know, because it, it became part of that, that concept of the story of the album. But, but yeah, I remember that. I forgot he wrote it about her. Um, and um, he wondered if uh, if she could foresee her own death, yes, even because she was a clairvoyant, um, much like the lady in this movie. Exactly. <clears throat> what was her name? Verna. Was me Vernie? Well, I don't know if I can. It was uh, <laughs> maybe that's something we should know, but uh, yeah, it's something like that. What yeah, is Verna or something. Her name is uh, Verna. Yes. Yeah. Verna. Was it night? What, what Nightingale? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there you go. Maybe yeah. Or there you go. Night. So night something. Night. Night something. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, very interesting. You know, it does the great guitar solo by David Murray. So definitely a fun song. Um, and I think it fits this movie pretty well. I would say yes. probably even better than the actual movie itself. So I'm yes. Say. But Allison, what do you got for us on the pro wrestling side? Oh well, yeah. So. This was another light week for wrestling, Um, but I did find something slightly interesting. Um, So the day before this movie came out in France, so perhaps we're waiting for our flight to leave to go to France. um, WWF was on tour doing their house show circuit, and they played two shows in the same day, which um, would never happen now, I don't think. But back then, people worked all the time. Yeah. Um, So the morning show, which had a thousand people in attendance, um, had was in Springfield, Massachusetts at the Civic Center. And I'm not going to go through the entire um, card, but I will talk about a few of the matches. So the match opened with Kurt Henning de- defeating Charlie Fulton, which I think would have been a great match. Anything Kurt Henning is doing is good. I think Kurt Henning is so good that he could, he could, um, 
he could make he could have a like like they say about Ric Flair he could have a match with a broomstick and it would be good. Yeah. <laughs> Although if he did, um, Jim Cornette would complain about it. Um, That's true. Then we had um, it's not so we had this enough. right exactly. Then we had a two out of three falls tag team match with Chief J Strongbow and Jules Strongbow. They defeated Mister Su- Mister Mister Suji Mister Fuji and Mister Saito in a. Like I said, in a two uh, two out of three falls match. Now I thought this had a really interesting ending because you know I, I I'm wondering um, I'm going to challenge you to can you think of a two out of fall or a two out of three falls match in his in recent history that didn't go the three falls <laughs> that somebody won after two falls because they always do the gimmick right so yeah. one wins one then the other wins one and then they have a match for the last one basically. No, I mean, um, but, I don't know. No, I can't name any. All right. So this one went 2-0 straight to the Strongbows. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering if maybe because it was a matinee show, they were like trying to get through this quicker. Yeah. Um, but basically, um, uh, Jules pinned Mr. Saito in fall number one. And then fall number two, Fuji and Saito were disqualified. And then that ended your match. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. Um, we have Ivan Putsky. Taking on superstar Billy Graham, which ended in a double count out because you can't have anybody, you know, being pinned in that one. Yeah. Um, and then your main event of the night I'm pinned nobody. was the WWF world champion Bob Backlund, who defeated Buddy Rose after seven minutes and 42 seconds. And I'll let you guess how he won. Okay. Double disqualification. No. Damn it. Submission with the crossface chicken wing. Oh, oh, he actually used the chicken wing. I thought he, he did. used he that used only it. in the nineties. Now okay, apparently he used it in the eighties as well. But yeah, he used the crossface chicken wing, and he defeated Buddy Rose. So that was your uh, afternoon shows, um, which I, I skipped some of the matches. But that was your uh, afternoon show. So that would be pretty good. So that that probably was what, like at one o'clock or something. Yeah, probably. You know, that was it. Yeah. You know, that was probably a two-hour show. So at three o'clock, they're done. So then the uh, nighttime show was in Thomaston, Connecticut. Uh, you got Kurt, H- uh, Kurt, Kurt, Hammett, Kurt Henning um, defeating Charlie Fulton again on the, on the curtain, uh, curtain jerker there. So Kurt Henning worked twice, um, which, uh, you know, most of the other people didn't work twice, but he worked twice. Um, you had Jules Strombo on the card again. He defeated Swede Hansen. Um, Swede Hansen was also on the uh, other card, and Jules was. Um, sweet old, Tony good Gria, old Hansen. Good old sweet Hanson. Yeah. You had Tony Gria who defeated Mr. Saito. Um, then you had Jay Strongbow who defeated Buddy Rose via disqualification. And then you had Ivan Putsky who defeated superstar Billy Graham via countout. So basically you had the same ending for that match and a couple of the other ones. Um, so I thought this was interesting because Bob Backlund, your world champion, did the matinee show, but he didn't do the nighttime show. Well, which know, I would think it would be the other way around. Yeah. But, you know. Well, kind of. Like, actually, if you kind of remember, in, like, the 80s, they they mostly did their big matches, like, at the beginning. Like, remember, like, Saturday Night's Main True. Event was all that. Like, they had, like, the big match at the beginning and did all the lesser matches at the end. I know, which is weird. But, yeah. yeah. We're getting yeah. that back. We're getting Saturday Night's Main Event back. Yeah, supposedly. Yeah, and the rumor is that um, Jesse Ventura is going to do commentary. On yeah, it. which would that be cool? That'd be kind of yeah interesting. I'm excited about this. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's you know, uh, it's kind of crazy though. And also, not that you mentioned the newer stuff. Apparently, uh, next year too, like apparently the the, the WWE is going to be doing a lot less, a lot less house shows of any house shows, which is really crazy. Yeah, I uh. think that they need to do something to compete with i know they don't believe this but they need to do something to compete um work wise with aew yeah because the aew contracts are so much better because even though you probably make a little less money you don't you work once a week and they're in your home the rest of the time whereas with wwe you're home maybe a day and a half a week and then every, every other time you're just you're going from city to city doing a house show in front of two thousand people or whatever yeah. Um, you know, so I think that a lot of people kind of get tired of uh 
of being on the road that much. And that's why AEW is so much more attractive to some people. And I don't really know how much money house shows actually make for them. Like, it just anymore. depends. Like, I don't, I don't know, you know, like, cause I saw, I haven't seen a house show since 2019. I saw a WWE house show when they came, they did a spot show in Asheville and I went to that and it was in the civic center, but the entire top, um, the entire balcony area was roped off and everybody was down on the floor. So there was maybe 2000 people there, maybe, um, you know, but I mean, it was cool. I got, you know, I was, I actually ended up being on the uh, on first row, which is the only time I've ever been on first row at WWE. Yeah. So it was kind of cool to see, you know, Drew McIntyre on, on first row from that close. And that was just kind of cool. Um, but, but yeah, it's kind of neat. Kind of neat. They're, uh, it's a, it's the new era, the Netflix era, if you will. The Netflix WWE. era, man, it's coming. It's going to be pretty yeah. wild. And it's gonna they're gonna be able to do anything they want, so we don't have to like bleep out uh, crowds cursing or anything like that anymore. Yeah. So when they get the rock back, he just curse all all the way, no problem. And he definitely will. So, but let's get into the who booked this shit, brother. Who booked this shit? The clairvoyant. So it was booked by a guy. I'll probably mess up his last name. Armand. Uh, Mastroni. That's pretty good. Um, I think it's Mastroianni. Mastroianni. Because he's, he's, he's an Italian, but he's from New York. Yes. Um, this guy. I don't know how much you know about this guy's career. He's made a lot of really good movies that I like. I know a, um, bit a lot of movies. Him. A lot of movies that we'll end up doing on this show, probably. Like he did. He knows you're alone. Um, and he did a movie called. Uh, what is it called? The Curse? Maybe. Yeah, anyway, uh, can't remember. I'm trying to do it off the top of my head. But he re- he directed. Uh, he knows you're alone. Yeah. Which was like his first like horror movie. Yeah, he did that before he did this movie. Yeah, that was in 1980. Uh, he did the Supernaturals a little bit after this movie. Cameron's Closet. In the 80s. Cameron's Closet. Yeah, yeah. He actually did a couple of TV shows. Um, Tales from the Dark Side. He did about four episodes. War of the Worlds, four episodes, and he did eight episodes of Friday the 13th, the series. Wow. Did a couple Dark Shadows ones in the 90s and stuff. So, yeah, you know, he's done a pretty good amount of stuff on here. Um, I mean, I, the whole, like, filming and direction and acting was fine. It's just, like, oh, yeah. the, yeah. Uh, I don't know, maybe it was, like, the I don't know, just something this film wasn't really, like, hitting me. You know what I mean? It just, it, it's like, it was a very decent film. And it did have a couple of shocking, like, I'm going to say they're shocking death scenes, but kind of like disturbing death scenes. Um, but I don't know. It just wasn't like, uh, for, for like a mission. Like, I knew the killer was like almost like right away, to be honest with you. Right. So, I mean, maybe maybe we just watched too many of these uh, style films. Uh, but I just, I don't know. I just guessed them right away, and I was right throughout the whole movie. So, but you know, it wasn't bad. Yeah. Yeah, I was about to say, I didn't really think it was too... I mean, who else could it be? I mean, if it wasn't the, who the killer... If it wasn't who it turned out to be, it would have to be someone who we hadn't seen before. Yeah. You know you know what I mean? Which is kind of a cheat if you're, like, trying to make an actual mystery. So a couple of uh, stuff about the actual film, kind of like what we talked earlier. The film's distribution renamed and sold it under The Killing Hour... Because they because they feared general audience wouldn't know what a clairvoyant was, and they're probably right about that. So that's one of their main. That's one of their reasons given. Besides all the reasons we probably gave it. <laughs> all right. It's like yeah. what, brother? What's this clairvoyant mean? I don't know. A, I don't know that word. Give me a. Give me. Give me an easier word to understand. It's probably also a hard word to say. Like people might not want to ask for a ticket because they might want to. They might think they would look stupid if they couldn't pronounce uh, yeah, it. Yeah, no. Right. Uh, can I go to that Claire, uh, Clarevin, something? <laughs> so uh, you know, this was also listed has a section three video nasty. I know. Which for, I mean, I, it makes sense. I understand why, but maybe like the last um, scene, I guess. Well, I think I think they probably didn't like the uh, the all the bondage aspects of it and like, you know, like which is weird for England. Like, well, that's a good point. They're all about but, the um, sex over there, brother. That's true. That's true. It's usually violence that causes or gore that causes a movie to be banned. 
But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that the idea of, of, you know, like when she's being handcuffed to the bed or whatever, and then like all that kind of stuff, I think that was the, that was, uh, probably what got it seized, if you will, which is weird to me still to think that a movie could be seized. Yes. Because they just didn't want people to see it. Very interesting stuff. Um, so this is the, this story was also, Partially inspired by the son of, son of Sam Murders spree that shocked New York City in the late 70s. The yeah. crime is re- referenced multiple times during the film, which I mentioned earlier as well, too. Uh, the movie poster from Anna Hall and All Through the Night came can be seen on the walls of Weeks' apartment. Mm-hmm. So we had a couple movie posters there in the background. Yeah, Annie Hall, the Woody Allen movie, and I'm not sh- I'm not familiar with All Through the Night. Yes. And let's see. And apparently our boy Dennis Wolfberg, mm-hmm. this was his first uh, movie that he acted in. And um, go ahead. I was going to say, was it, it? No, I guess it wasn't. Okay, I, was, I just looked it up. But it, uh, I was wondering, it has to be a pretty early movie. I thought it would be a pretty early movie for Perry King, too, but he had been acting since the seventies, so I guess not. And I'm trying to see who Wolfenberg played on here. Uh, he's not listed in a cast list that I have. Yeah, me either. Even though they said he was on here, is he Weeks? No, Weeks was played by Norman Parker. Hmm. Dennis Wolfenberg. Interesting. And let me see. Perry, no um, it did. I was gonna say it did have Kenneth McMillan in it, yes. who played um, the cop, the lieutenant, was like my favorite it, character. Yeah, but I know him as uh, he played Baron Harkonnen in David Lynch's Dune. Oh, okay, that's right. I thought he did look familiar. A couple of years later, yes. Um, Yeah, I mean, it says he plays on here, but I cannot see him in the listing at all. Very interesting. Yeah, I don't, he's not any cast list that I have, but he could he could play a very minor role. Yeah, I mean, you know, maybe he's one of those guys in the back. Um, also, very interesting. Joe Morton is in this. Yes, which is uh, he's Joe. actually been. Uh, I was actually I never actually seen him young before. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, when I saw him, I was like, "Who is that guy?" Yeah. But then, um, yeah, he was the cop in Speed. Yes. That's probably his, one of his more famous roles, but he was also in Lone Star, which is a really good movie, a really good Texas movie. If you want to, if you want to watch a good murder mystery, Lone Star is really good. Um, uh, he was in the some of those Zack Snyder DC movies. Um, yeah, he's a great actor, um, great, fantastic actor, Joe Morton. Okay, I I film. figured out what our boy from Wolfberg was. Yes, I figured out what our boy from Quantum Leap, who he was. He was that second comedian, you know, when uh, wow. Vern, Vern and Weeks go into the com- comedy bar on their little yeah. date together. He was yeah. the comedy guy in there doing all the jokes about, uh, God, what was the jokes about? It was like, like about like, it was like some sexual jokes and some wolf jokes on there. Mm-hmm. He was that guy. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Very interesting. Very interesting. You go from, uh. You go from the clairvoyant to quantum leap. Big difference there. Big difference. So let's see what else we got about this movie. Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. On here. Uh, we talked about the video nasty stuff. Releases on here. So, you know, like we were saying earlier, it was purchased by 20th Century Fox in 1982, but was only released basically in theaters in France in 1984. Uh, no, it was released on video in nineteen. Yeah, video. Yes, yes. Yeah, and uh, and then they were, you know, uh, Anchor Bay Entertainment were released it later on in two thousands under the Killing Hour, um, because you know they wanted people to uh, figure out what a clair- what is a clairvoyant. Why don't we ask that for everybody? What is this clairvoyant? What is the definition of this clairvoyant? Clairvoyant is someone who can foresee the future. Oh, you can foresee the future, brother. Mm-hmm. All right. Which is kind of what happened in this. Sort yes, of. kind of, yes. Well, through her block paintings. Through her paintings, through her art. So, 
Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, there's not a whole lot about this particular movie. To me, it was just like a normal film. Like, hey, we're doing a film about somebody who can see deaths in pictures. Hopefully, it will uh, hopefully it'll yeah. get, get people to uh, come on out there and uh, spend your... Uh... How much do you think a ticket was in France at this time? $3? <laughs> I doubt it. I don't know. I have no idea. I don't know much about 1980s French currency. You think they gave you some uh, champagne while you're in there? Probably, yeah. So, but speaking of champagne, let's get into let's get into the full review of the clairvoyant, aka the Killing Hour. Let's do it. It started as a game and turned into a nightmare. She was an art student. She had the power to see things beyond the normal range of human senses. With a terrifying talent, she became a silent witness to murder. I saw the drawings, Verna. Two men were drawn into the killings. One was a cop. What do you want? The other a TV reporter. What do you think I want? We both know those killings aren't just another statistic. I want to use them on my show. How do you make these drawings? My hand takes over. Well, how does that happen? It's unconscious. I'm not going to let anything happen to you. Both men became involved in her life. Both men loved her. One of them had to kill her. I want the girl kept out of this. Don't put her on the show. Are you paying her rent? What's all the interest? He might try to kill her. The Killing Hour, a film in the finest tradition of suspense. Okay, so we start off the film (laughs) with some... Painting of some naked lady. Yeah. You ever been to one of those classes, Allison? You know what I mean? Where you go in there, you have like a nudist artist and you're painting the body? I I have not because I've not done any kind of um, art like that ever. But uh, yeah. But yeah, you could uh, could sign up for an art class. We could sign up for an art class and see nudity. Did you ever see the Beavis and Butthead episode? Where they go to that nudist art class? <laughs> no, but I have a thousand. It's fantastic. fantastic. <laughs> They're just laughing the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there was like another one too. Like I, it was either Family Guy or Simpsons. Where like they like they look at the teacher like, should I draw the penis? <laughs> <laughs> oh god! I can't it's remember not which Simpsons. one. Was. That's definitely Family Guy. Is the Sam- yeah, that's probably Family Guy. No. It was one of the yeah, two. I it was it was hilarious. Oh, that, Simpsons that, that, would Simpsons would have more intelligent humor than that. That's that's still kind of funny. I yeah. Guess. So it was one of those two. It could have been Beavis and Butthead. I, all I remember is like every time I see like some of like the uh, the painting stuff like that, I'll think Beavis and Butthead or that Family Guy joke. So mm-hmm. while this is all happening, them painting the girl, the girl, mm-hmm. all right, and her joy trail, or they uh, um, <laughs> painting that as well. Wow. The one yeah. girl is painting X's over the dead person's body. Well, we see then we see some girl in the, in the river. Mm-hmm. All right, where we find out that her name is um, Betty Mercer. Okay, that's the girl who's in the uh, the the basically the the ocean. She's all hanged up and she's dead. Yeah, she's all handcuffed, right? Still, yes, I believe. Yeah, and he, the cop gets her on everything. And she, and then the the girl basically just uh, who's doing the painting, just like scratching over this painting. All right. Then, all right, we go right away to Perk swimming. All right, the the the, the I guess the the gym is called Perk. Okay. Oh right, yes, Perk, yes. <laughs> and this, then we see this guy in here. Uh, I believe his name is going to be named Bird or Bert, one of the two. 
and he's swimming, and somebody turns off the lights. This is like when we actually got a little bit of that Italian red light in the background. So it was like a little the bit, scene. Yeah. yeah. I think that, um, honestly, I think this is one of the things that disappointed me a little bit when I watched it the first time because when I got the we got the Italian red light and I'm like oh this is gonna be like a, a gallo film yeah and then it then it wasn't but yeah. um so I think I got my hopes up a little bit too much almost there. um but yeah so to me this is probably like the most like fucked up scene in the whole film mm-hmm. I was like oh god it's nasty so the guy is in there this it's dark out there in the well kind of dark you can still see everything and he's wondering, he's trying to get back up to, you know, figure out who turned on the light, who turned off the lights. So right before he gets in there, the killer comes behind him and handcuffs his foot to the bottom rail of the swimming pool. Yeah. So, so yeah. The, I was a little bit confused by this. So the killer is in the water, but he doesn't know that. Well, yeah, the killer is actually a expert scuba diver. Okay. He was okay. in the Navy SEALs from about <laughs> 1974 to about 1981, and he knew how to scuba dive in silence. Wow. You were the master of, even though you can't pronounce anybody's names, yes. everybody has talent, and your talent is you are the master of the elevator pitch. <laughs> exactly. I just, ma- I just make up bad <laughs> like, stories that are not there. I mean, you could come up with like a backstory for anybody on a in a second's notice. Yeah, I get to see you like, you know, like talking to executives like and trying to pitch your movie, and they're like, "No, I don't like that." One. Okay, how about this? How about this? <laughs> how about this? How about this? You just made them all up right there as you're going. I'd be like, but, "Yeah." How about we put him in a box, <laughs> <laughs> and then we open the box and he comes out? Huh? That'll get over. I swear. And then when they finally buy one, you come back to me and you're like, "All right, we got to write a movie about this." Yeah. Like what? This is what I sold them. That's what I sold them, brother. <laughs> they promised me eight hundred. They're only gonna give me four. <laughs> like this movie. So we right? gotta like, cut out all the travel scenes. <laughs> yeah, the travel. Yes. The so bridges. this guy. I mean, this, this. This to be honest with you. Like for you know, this is like a freaky death. I mean, he got locked uh, yeah. under the handcuffs. He can't get out. He's barely on there. He's trying to saw his. Well, he's, he's trying to get his leg out, but he can't. And he eventually drowns. And I was like, oh god, that's creepy. Ew. <sighs> yeah, I mean, I think that that is scary for me in particular because drowning is a scary death to me. Yeah. Even though it probably wouldn't be like the worst death you could have, but I mean, like it, it might be it, one of the worst. A, it, it might be, you know, cause it's like, it's one of those things where like most other deaths would happen quick enough that you would be, you probably really wouldn't know it. You know what I mean? Like if you were in a car accident, you might know for a second or two that something's wrong. Um, or if you were like bleeding to death, like for a couple of minutes, you'd be bleeding out, but then you'd lose consciousness. But like with this, you're just like, you know, trying to survive. You're trying to hold your breath, but you can't. And then as soon as you breathe in water, you're going to start dying. But like, he's like right above, he, like his hand can come out of the water, yeah, but his head can't get out of the water. Um, and like, yeah, that, that shit's fucking terrifying. Yeah. Yeah freaks me out right just even talking about it so that was the most that to be honest with you that right there was probably the most disturbing scene to me on well the second the 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 last scene is kind of disturbing too but it's different yeah for a different reason so then then we get more murders right away we're just getting out the murders quickly all right we're we're moving this shit along because we have dialogue to get to all right so we we see a uh, a construction worker conveniently had a diner next to his job site. So this is New York City. That's probably not that unusual. Yes, that's true. Out here, uh, that never happens. So now, so now no, the no. no. So now he he he's getting his dinner. He's going back into his hole, and then the handcuff killer comes and handcuffs him and electrocutes his ass. And then the then the lights kind of flicker. And all the people from the uh, the restaurant, the diner, they come out and they they find the uh, the dead worker. And then we have our main girl, Verna Nightborn. Nightborn, that's her name. Yes, not not Nightingale. The hell is Nightingale from? I have no idea. Uh, Nightborn, she was out there, and she's like painting very angrily. Yes. All right. So now we see the cops, and the cops are looking over the dead uh, swimmer's body, which uh, I like how the guy was like holding his junk while he was dead there. Yeah. Yeah, we can't show that, brother. 
And uh, well, he, but we do later on though. There's a scene where the guy, the guy is just like completely naked while they're take their uh, uh, painting him or whatever. Oh yeah, I, I believe so. I don't remember that scene. Oh, maybe. Uh, maybe had maybe you maybe had the maybe you had the ex- <laughs> <laughs> maybe you had the uh, the 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 rated NC seventeen <laughs> cut there, Allison. Maybe. maybe. Maybe, uh, maybe, uh, maybe uh, I don't know. That's weird. Okay. So they're they're going anyway. over. They're they're asking basically if this guy got sexually molested. And they're right. like, no, no. It looks like he was just handcuffed to the water and he was trying to struggle out there. All right. And they're uh, go ahead. Okay. Yes. No, I was gonna say like they do they like why do they believe that? What that he was sexually molested. No, 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 that he was... So they were saying he wasn't handcuffed, right? Didn't no, know no, 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 they said he was handcuffed and they could oh, okay. say... Oh, okay, I see. All right, I was confused yeah. by that statement because he clearly has yeah. a scar on his leg where the handcuff was. Yeah, they're saying, like, you know, obviously he got handcuffed to the... And he was trying to break his leg out of the out of the handcuffs, but it didn't yeah. work. Yeah, no. And didn't the, like, then, like, they were saying, like, the the guy who did this must have been very strong. Like our killer must have been very strong to get this guy who was swimming, because they they were saying that the guy that got killed by swimming did three hundred push ups before he got into the water. That's a lot of push ups. I was like, well, how did you know it was? Did you ask people at the gym how many push ups he did? <laughs> it is weird that they know this specifically, but that's uh-huh. a whole lot of push ups. Like, can you do three hundred push ups? I mean, not right now. <laughs> and you're in pretty good shape. I could probably do like one fifty. I could probably do like four, there but, um, but, um, but the, uh, but yeah, I don't know. That's, that's a lot of push ups, I think. So, so now they're talking about the, uh, the Lieutenant. Okay. Which we talked about Lieutenant, uh, what was it? Colin. Yeah. Played by the Kenneth. Uh, the guy, he said he was in doom, right? What was his name? Um, yeah, but Kenneth M- McMillan. McMillan, yeah, Kenneth yes. McMillan. He was in Dune as Detective Cullen. So, yeah, he was Detective Cullen over here. And this guy, well, Lieutenant, also, he was Lieutenant Cullen, basically. He was like, this guy was just on everybody's ass the whole time. All right? He was all like, listen, we're not going to publicize this. We don't need some new named killer out here. All right? And then Rick, all right, who's played by Joe Morton. Rick was all mm-hmm. like, well, you know, this could be a, um, oh God, what did he call it? Um, this could be a, uh, uh, he, uh, Rick called it a uniform char- character, characteristics by the killer. Mm-hmm. And yeah. the tenant's like, well, what do you mean by that? R- you know, bookie, like he, cause he's all smart and he's, he came out of the academy. He's yeah. like, well, you know, he's doing a he's lot of the same. Learning. Yeah, he said he's doing all all this. Uh, you know, we could see by the characteristics and the way he kills, he's all doing it very uniform, like he's doing it the same way each time. Mm-hmm. And the town was all like, "Don't give me all that bookworm stuff. Just give me the facts." Right. Don't give me any of your huh? college educated knowledge. Yeah, and then he's all like, <laughs> and like I guess like this guy has like a nervous tick where he'll like bite his finger. And he's all like, yeah. he's all like, it's bleeding. And he looks at the mortician guy, who was like, this mortician guy, played by Robert Kerman, was yeah. apparently some huge porno star during the golden age of porno films. He was one of the main Which, stars in Debbie Does Dallas, brother. It was our fucking... Wow. Uh, yes. We got us a celebrity in this movie. And he was also... Okay. Mm-hmm. He was also... Harold Morin in the controversial horror film *Cannibal Holocaust*. Interesting. He was, it's, you know, it's, he was a medical examiner, <laughs> and Colin doesn't care about his porn history or his cannibal history. He asked him, "No, do you have a band aid?" Our, our mortician guy says, "No." He's like, "You don't got a fucking band aid?" No, he only works on dead people. It's like I only work on dead people. And that's it, bro. That's the last thing we see of him. <laughs> so that's kind of interesting, though, because yes. I did not know that. And I did not remember him from Cannibal Holocaust either, um, which, um, spoiler, we might be talking about Cannibal Holocaust fairly soon. 
um, in some aspect. But um, the um, um, we've ta- I've talked about this before, and we've mentioned it especially in the history of uh, the career of Wes Craven. But um, there's a there's a huge overlap in early 1980s horror and 1970s porn. Yes. Um, a lot of the same directors went from directing porn films to directing horror films. And a lot of the actors also tried to make a transition from porn films to legitimate films um, with uh, with horror movies. And this, I guess, this guy was one of them. So, yeah, and he's in one of the most famous horror movies. Um, Porn movies of all time. Debbie does Dallas. Yes. Interesting. He was putting in some hard work, if you know what I mean. So we get <laughs> yes. So we get a <laughs> see what you did there. So we get a unfunny comedian. This is where we meet Weeks. Mm. All right. Yes. Mister Mister uh, uh, Larry Weeks. All right. And he's doing all this this comedy. I just thought it was just lame. But maybe it's funny for the it, time period. I was about to say it might have been funny at the time, but like I mean, like you know, like doing a George Burns impersonation now. I'm probably people knew who George Burns is, but you know, in 1982, I guess that was funny. So we have uh, Sporico. He is there, and he talks to Weeks, being like, "Hey, you know, you missed the cheat, the lieutenant's call and stuff. He's gonna be mad that you're doing your dumb comedy shit on the clock." That is weird, right? He's yeah. doing, he's on the clock, but he's at a comedy show, and he has yeah. his gun on and everything. Yeah, he's like, oh, you know, it's like, whatever, man. Didn't he make some more jokes? I was like, oh, God. We're going to hear all those dumb <laughs> jokes the whole time. So, <laughs> <laughs> See where this is going. So he they pulled him to the crime scene where the uh, the guy that was the, the worker died in the little his little tent area. So he gets there. He talks to the lieutenant and everything. The lieutenant's chewing his ass out. Hey, you doing that unfunny comedy shit again? <laughs> Basically, he was saying, it's like, you know, you got to be on call over here. Yeah. And then he's like, he does, the lieutenant does say, hey, if you do this again, you're going to eat my badge. And this is how unfunny um, Weeks' his comedy is. Well, just put some uh, ketchup and mustard, some salt on it for you, and it tastes good. Ha, 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 ha. Look at me, I'm fine. Holy Jesus Christ! Yeah, um, I don't even understand the whole "eat my badge" thing. Is that like a? Is he going to like? It's a threat, there, Allison. I mean, it is a threat. Yes. Yeah, eat my badge. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. So the biggest part about this scene is this is when we get introduced to the character Paul Mac McCormick, who is a Channel Six newscaster, and he wants the uh, the scoop. On, mm-hmm. on the killing here. Lieutenant comes up to, to Mac, and I like their conversation, because he basically tells Max like, listen, don't go near my fucking tent. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We should have got more of this guy, this lieutenant guy. He was like the best part of this fucking movie. Tent. He, he just, was, you're right. He's just angry at everybody. He don't give a fuck. Everybody he's just angry at. So then he leaves, and then now we see that Mac is now talking to Weeks, and Mac is trying. I guess they know each other because you know. I guess Mac is like a semi-popular news reporter, mm-hmm. even though he's acting like his his career just got began. But everybody seems to know him. Um, so now Mac is talking to Weeks, and they're coming up with the plan to. But basically, Mac wants to know more details about the actual murder so he could say it on his show. Uh, mm-hmm. Weeks says, like, I'm not allowed. The chief doesn't want this stuff out there because like, we don't want to have... We don't... Basically, they don't want... They don't want, like, the Son of Sam stuff. They don't want this to be publicized. The chief doesn't because he doesn't want, you know, the town to be worried and stuff. So they don't want to... They don't want to... It's already been, like, a, a two-part murder with handcuffs. So they don't want to make it, like, known to be, like, a murder or nothing. Um, but then uh, Mac does bring up that Warner Armstrong can help his career out weeks to be on TV compared to doing this dirty cop work. You could be a famous comedian doing all kinds of unfunny jokes on the air, at least. So He can, yeah. He's trying to be a famous comedian. Yes. Um, so now, so basically that's what he's luring him to. Mac is luring weeks into giving him information so, so Mac can get a sit-down meeting with weeks and uh, Mac uh, uh, Weeks eventually he agrees to it basically, okay? Because then mm-hmm. we cut back and now we're going to be on Mac Mac's show, 
okay? And he's getting ready for his newscast show, okay? And Allison and everybody, do you know what his show is called? It's it's called Talk Back with Paul McCormick. Very clever. Very clever. Very clever. Talk Back. Yes. So then also, too, we do get a scene. Uh, we finally meet our girl, Verna Nightingborn. She is our main uh, girl who draws the crazy pictures. And she, with her roommate, Muriel Watson, they live together. Watson, she works at the hospital. And she was complaining about a new intern following her around all day. Which, uh, you know, people who work and been with your job for a long time, you know about all the newbies following you around all day. Mm-hmm. They talk about boys and how Vera doesn't get any kind of dates. That will change pretty soon. Oh, boy, does it ever. And then they, uh, they, Vern also talks about, and this is a uh, vein on my existence. She's saying, well, you know, I quit my job to pursue my art. Wow. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I was like, okay, listen, she doesn't, she doesn't want to be a waitress. I get, but she draws this art that she doesn't want to show anybody. So how, how's that going to work out? Like, I'm cool if you're a good no. artist and stuff. You can make money from it. But, like, you probably have to, like, sell your shit to do it. True. True. So. Hmm. So then we get the uh, we get the Warner uh, talking about um, some of the murders to it. Then Warner, she, she was like, or Watson, sorry. Watson was like, hey, I saw the paintings. She's like, okay, well, it won't happen again. It won't happen again, I swear. And then, like, well, let's just go out for dinner or something like that. Okay. So you can see that the Werner, she has, you know, obviously she's, you know, having these paintings that she doesn't really want to, she kind of wants to hide it a secret. So the <clears throat> two girls, they also bring up Betty Mercer. Because yes. Watson asked her, hey, that girl who died, Betty Mercer, you know, she did those pornographic films. Hey. <laughs> She lived in Philadelphia. Hey, your family's from Philadelphia. Do you know her? Yes. I just All know right. every <laughs> pornographic person that lives in Philadelphia. That's what I would have said if I was that burner girl. <laughs> yeah, I thought this was really strange, too, um, especially considering what we find out a little later. But um, it is um, – wh- why would you think <laughs> – I mean, Philadelphia, even in 1982, was a big city. Like, why would you think – that someone would know her just because they're both in New York at the same time and from the same big city. Like I just think that's weird. Well, you know, it's because she would that she knows because her. it was a plot. It's a, the, the plot needed that to happen exactly. Yes. So now we see this is when we get Mac, and we do get a couple shots of Mac rowing his boat gently mm-hmm. down the stream. Barely, barely, yeah. Yes. So. <laughs> So now we're, now he's getting ready for his talk show. Like I said, we have the very creative name called Talk Back with Paul McCormick. So he starts uh, reading some letters. All right. And he first he's doing his normal broadcast. But then he says he has some breaking news on the, uh, the killings that's been happening around New York. And everybody's like, well, this guy's going off script right now. Mm-hmm. And... He goes on about the murders and how, you know, disgusting they are and how the, the killer has been using some handcuffs. And then he's giving out some details uh, about some of the, the murders that are happening there. Like, you know, handcuffing them and they might all be related. Uh, the Bert, Betty Murcher killing was probably related to the two other guys that got killed as well, too. And we have our next serial killer on here because all these we have a depraved maniac on the loose. Uh, he goes on, and he, and then basically, while this is happening, Weeks is looking at the TV like, oh, shit. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what he thought was going to happen, but that's what happened right. pretty much. But that's what did happen. Yes. So, basically, Mac was spilling some beans, and now Weeks is pretty much looking at himself like, oh, shit, the, 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 the lieutenant's going to have my ass. All right? Yeah. And, of course, you know, this is when Mac was saying, like, we got another son of Sam on our, on our case over here. So now 
Mac is leaving, and I believe it was the Warner Armstrong was saying to Mac, like, hey, you know, what are you doing here, giving out all these details of this crime and stuff? You know, this is Channel 6, man. We don't do that tabloid business. All right, and then now Mac is kind of getting like recognized from the town and everything. And he says, like, oh, yeah, look, at the public loves me and stuff. As long as they're watching and stuff, that is what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be getting these ratings. All right, let's just go to lunch sometime and we'll talk about the business. And the guy kind of agrees because, you know, it's all about the ratings. Mm-hmm. Which, that was kind of like a, I believe, to me, unless I, I don't believe I missed it. Because I was watching this movie pretty closely. Like, they didn't really, like, explore Max. uh greed for being on the uh the tv as much i thought like this that they, 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 they could have i agree you know yeah I mean? they, like, they could have they could have delved deeper into that because when we find out later the the main purpose for his character i just thought like was a little strange of like you know the, the well we'll get there but i just mm-hmm. thought it was a little strange but we'll get there so now we have now um uh, we have some uh, uh, Vern. She's leaving. Okay, and uh, well, <laughs> actually no. We had this other guy who's out of a New York bar, sweating and drinking. Okay, mm-hmm. he's looking over and he finally sees a dude with a dog. Okay, which I think this this guy was the guy with the dog. I think he's been in some movies we've done before because he looked pretty familiar. But yeah, he, the guy looks nervous, all right, and then he leaves, and then the guy follows him into the restroom, pulls out a knife, and then the guy gives him an envelope with cash, and then gives him some handcuffs. He's like, do you understand? So, we'll see what happens Weird. like that. We're back at the, the cop office. Foreshadowing, they call that. Foreshadowing, brother. We're back at the cop office. Some crazy lady is going on about how she's pissed off and she uses handcuffs and stuff. And now the lieutenant's mad because he feels like he's going to have every whack a in here <laughs> talking about like they're the killer. All right? Well, and yeah. he does have that one lady who says, arrest me now. Yes. So now, then, <laughs> so lieutenant's going crazy on everybody. He looks over to Weeks saying, hey, Weeks, I think you need to ask for a transfer. And Weeks is like, you know, basically saying, why? I didn't, say, I didn't say anything, cop. I didn't say anything to him. I don't know how he heard. He might have overheard one of us. I didn't tell him anything. Yeah. All right. And and then Weeks says, and I quote him, <clears throat> Chief, I'm as pure as a baby's ass. Yeah. What does that mean? Are, are baby's ass as pure? Yeah. Well, prone to Weeks, they are, because, you know, he's a jokester. Ha, ha, ha. That's mm. funny. Uh, that's so funny. So then uh, uh, his partner, Sparico, says, yeah, one with the dirty diaper. Ha, <laughs> ha, God. Funny. Jesus Christ. Yeah. They're all comedians. I love it. <laughs> so now, now Weeks is pissed off, so he goes to visit Mac. Mac is uh, sleeping in the afternoon. Weeks talks about Mac's about fucking up his life. And then, mm. Ma- and then uh, Mac was like, hey, how old are you? And Weeks is like, I'm 35. And I'm like, this motherfucker's 35. I look younger than he does right now. He and I'm almost fucking people, 40. People looked older than then. They, they lived uh-huh. a hard life. Oh, Mac, 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 look, he, he looked a little young. So I, I'll give him that. Mac mm. said he's like 33. And he's basically saying, hey... Weeks, you got your whole life ahead of you. Why why does it matter? You know, you're you're basically a struggling comedian. But if you mm-hmm. solve this case with me, I can get you on TV and you could probably even have the lieutenant's job because this is gonna be a very high profiled case. So if we work this case together and we catch this killer, I mean we're both gonna be famous. So you can kind of see Mac's goal is to be famous on the TV and he's trying to get his leak, which is Weeks. To help him out, and he's going to help him bring him up. You know what I mean? So that's the that's the goal of Mac over here. So then they're like, okay, let me go make you some food, and we'll talk about it. Um, let's see. So now we have, and then during this time, the guy with the dog is watching. So this is when we have Verna, 
She leaves in a hurry. She drops her weird paintings. The guy looks at him, looks at her weird, and she leaves. Compelling. So Rick, he's there now, and he says that they got, um, they got, uh, they got no. Ev- he basically, Rick is telling, like, "Listen, Chief, I got no evidence." All right. And then the 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 leaf the lieutenant's like, okay, well, why don't you hit up the local porn shop in the back alleys, and you try to dig some dirt on this Betty Warner, you bookworm. Yeah. So he tells him to go off. And then lieutenant tells uh, uh, Sapero, I was like, yeah, I was like, I got, I got, I got to watch over. He basically tells Sapero to watch over weeks, okay, because mm-hmm. he's up to something. And he's all like, I got a comedian and I got a bookworm. What does this <laughs> thing come to? Wow. <laughs> and then we have, so Mac now on his show again, Channel 6, right? And he's like, okay, we're going to take some phone calls today. Okay. And like, I only want to hear phone calls for the, uh, from the handcuff murders. That's what he's calling them. So no, no shit, the first call was like pretty funny to me. It was like a bus driver. He's like, listen, I drive buses all around this New York. And every time I drop off one of these hookers around here they keep messing up my territory and max like what does this got to do with the handcuff killer the guy's like i oh, don't nothing <laughs> <laughs> nothing so then he hangs up the phone and then we get a strange uh message um from the uh supposedly the killer what uh saying like um, um max in trouble and he, he's gonna come and get him so now we have Vern. she sees a girl being handcuffed in her dreams which we'll find out who that is later pretty much going to be the Betty girl. Mm-hmm. Uh, she also, Vern also uh, walks weird around at her home. <laughs> That's in my notes. And then her, uh, her, her friend Watson uh, scares her and stuff. And then she's basically very all freaking out. Cause she keeps having these dreams, keep having a lot of uh, doing her, 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 her paintings with all the, the murders happening. And then they kind of basically, they agreed to, show these pictures to the cops now. All right. mm-hmm. So she shows it to the cop. We see uh, Sp- uh, Sparico. So pretty much the whole team's there. Uh, Weeks is there. Uh, Colin's there. Rich is there. Sparico's uh, there. They're showing all the paintings and stuff. And then they ask her, you know, like, how did you come up with these paintings? What is the whole story behind them? And then she gives us this long explanation of the story saying, well, when I was younger, I was in the classroom. I was looking out the window. There was some 16-year-old girl there. She moved. I followed her down the street. And it was like, they were like, okay, well, did you just see her in a dream? No, no. It was, I was physically there walking with her. Mm-hmm. And then she just disappeared. And then we found out this was a missing person and then during all this stuff Colin was like get the get the file and they eventually Lieutenant says okay well the girl in your dream who's who you named Elizabeth she had a couple aliases and one of her alias was Betty Warner so they're the same girl and you are somehow magically linked to her that wasn't really explained how, but she was. And then during this, yes. Mac walks in and he hears parts of it. And basically he, you know, he's like, oh shit, we have somebody who's drawing the murders on here. And I could probably exploit them on my show. That's what he's thinking. And basically Lieutenant tells him to get out of there. And then eventually, um, uh, Werner kind of freaks out a little bit, you know, you know, she she didn't realize that the same girl from her from her youth, that when she discovered her powers, was the same girl who died. That was the porno star that she should have known from Philadelphia because her parents lived there. Apparently, yes. So then she she freaks out a little bit, and then they she you know Vern uh, her, uh, Watson takes her home, and then this is when uh, Weeks comes out to her and gives her the card her card. And says, like, hey, if you ever see any of these dreams at all, just give me a call only. All right. And then she leaves. Then we start getting some love triangle stuff. Which uh, was very interesting. 
So not even the same scene of her crying and leaving. Now we're back at Werner's uh, apartment. And we see that Mac McCormick has showed up. He kind of lets himself in. Uh, Vern is a little smitten by him because he's on TV. All right, the local newscast guy on the TV. Mm -hmm. And they were... So they're going back and forth. And basically, he she was like saying, oh, you're not going to get me on your show. I don't want to talk about my paintings or nothing like that. I don't want to do this. <clears throat> I don't want to do that. And Max like, listen, I got a good jawline and I'm young and I'm on TV. I'm going to flirt with you and I'm going to make you be on my show. Which is basically kind of what happened. So he basically, so during, when they're with this, Weeks calls her and he calls her and he's saying like, hey, whatever you do, don't go on to Max show. That's not good for you. You know, we don't want to, you don't want to, you don't want to tempt the killer to let you know who you are. All right, but Max saying like, "Hey, I'm pretty sure the killer already knows who you are." Foreshadowing, and you know, he's gonna know who you are anyway. So if you were super duper famous, the killer can't touch you because you'll be so well known. And that's a pretty interesting fact, Allison. What do you think about that? Um, if you're like super famous, you know what I mean, and you're part of like a murder triangle, do you think the murderer won't come after you because you're so famous? That doesn't seem to be the case um, in any recorded history. Exactly. <laughs> According to Mac, you know what I mean? He said, like, ah, no, it's all good. If you're famous, well, he you has a Well, he has a reason for saying that, though. Yes, that's true. So, eventually, they go out to dinner. Mac and uh, Verna. Nice, good little Italian spot. Mac's flirting with her a little bit. You know, basically wants her to be on the show. And this is when Verna was telling her about all the tests she's had. She's had all kind of e, e, uh, EKGs and stuff. She's been wrapped up, but nobody has ever gave her a crystal ball. All right. So they go back to a deal. Um, they eventually make a deal when Mac kisses her outside to be on the show. So after some smitten... Mac eventually convinced her to be on his show to talk about some of the murders. So now we're at a a hotel, sleazy one. Of course. So we see the uh, sweaty guy from earlier. He's pissed out at some random hooker. So he gets on out of there. And while he's leaving, he gets handcuffed. And then I get, I get, well, basically gets knocked out, then he gets handcuffed, and he gets handcuffed to the bottom of the elevator, and we have an elevator basically crush him. So, pretty crazy death there, too. And we don't yeah, see the actual elevator. To, uh, yeah, yeah, he's there to uh, hook up with, uh, with her, and then uh, gets destroyed by the elevator. Elevator death. Yes. So now, now Mac is on his show, saying that I... Okay, so after this all happened <clears throat> with the elevator death, Mac is coming home and Mac gets attacked by the dog guy. Okay, but the dog guy doesn't attack him well and he gets scared by the uh, house maid and so the guy runs out and then Mac goes on to a show the next day saying, no thanks to the police, I got attacked by the handcuff killer and I have physical evidence right over here of the uh, the handcuffs this one tried to use on me. So now she has now he has the special guest on his show and Verna is on there and she is about to be drawing uh, some of the, you know, talk about her drawings and, and what's happened to her. So she's uh, you know, she's, we see her like a little bit talk about some of the murders on there and then Weeks comes to Werner's um, apartment and this is where like I was getting kind of confused with the movie because yes we established that Mac is already like Mac on her you know what I mean yes so yes. she's smitten with Mac but then one visit from weeks weeks is talk about like hey I don't want you on this show I think you're 
you're, you know, you're going to be taunting the killer. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And like, you know, I just, I, I'll make sure nothing happens to you. I will protect you. And then she's like, oh, you got a nice sweater. And it's like, okay, yeah, the, it's the, uh, thank you. It's, it's my, my mom gave it to me. Oh, by the way, <laughs> by the way, uh, your eyes, they're like, you, you have like, your eyes remind me of my kid sister's eyes. All very awkward and weird. And she's like, oh, I didn't know you had a kid sister. He's like, well, I don't. But if I did, your eyes remind me of him. Even more awkward and weird. So, you know, I'm not the flirt man over here. You know what I mean? <laughs> but I don't think if you go up to a girl, like, yo, you got my kid sister's eyes. Let's fuck. Like, that might be kind of creepy. <laughs> Especially when you say I don't really have a kid sister. Yeah. Yeah. So, but this Vern girl, she was like, oh, my God, what a great line. Oh, my God. I'm getting all hot and wild over here for this Weeks guy. And I was like, wait a minute. Well, weren't you just macking on the Mac over here? Didn't, didn't we just hear at the beginning that you're having trouble finding dudes? What is mm-hmm. going on here? So, Weeks and all them, now they're, now he's going to bring her out to dinner. Mm-hmm. Okay. And he's, so they go out to the, uh, well, they start, actually, no. So, they start, like, kissing. Okay. Mm-hmm. And... This is like when they're going to be like on the, uh, uh, so this is when she has plans with Mac, but Week says, I need you to cancel those plans. And she's like, yeah, I, I believe I can cancel those plans. I was like, okay. <laughs> okay. Fair, this, enough. fair enough. Okay. So now <laughs> I write my notes here. So. Uh, Weeks does his dumb impressions that all sound the same. So now they went on a little mini date. We don't see the first mini date. But he takes her home, okay? And Weeks is now just kissing her while she's on the phone trying to get a hold of Watson. She was trying to call the operator to leave Watson a message to meet her at the comedy club. And this all happened very creepily with Weeks kissing up all, all upon her. Because they're in love now. Okay? Yes. So now we're at the comedy uh, show. And this is when we actually see the uh, Quantum Leap guy up here talking about wolves and orgasms and all kinds of stuff he's talking about. Everybody's laughing. And everybody at the comedy club knows Weeks. You know, he's bringing in Verna. He kisses Verna a little bit. He goes to backstage because he's going to perform tonight. So Vern's sitting there, and then she gets a phone call. I always like this. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like you, this doesn't happen anymore. Like, you know, let's say we're out like a, like a, like a comedy club, Allison, and someone wants to get a hold of me. They would literally call the club. Uh, know, a waitress would come all the way to yeah. you and be like, hey, you have a phone call. Like, how the fuck would you even know who I am? You know what I mean? Is there like a <laughs> list of where I'm sitting at at the table or something? I like, guess, I guess that's how that works. But I don't know. Like, I mean, like used to used to get like, uh, um, calls at hotels. Yeah, well, like that's people fine. would call the hotel desk and have. Then that makes sense because you know they I, you're in the sign room, room two twelve, right? But like, I, I I do I do think that's weird, and that's something that's even before my time. Like, I just don't understand. Like, because you see it in movies all the time. Like, people get calls at restaurants. Like, how do they know who that person is? Yeah. You know, like if we're at a Buffalo Wild Wings or whatever, eating wings and drinking beer and watching football, and they call Buffalo Wild Wings and ask to speak to one of us, like how the fuck are they going to know who we are? Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, maybe it was a thing. Maybe that actually did happen, but I I think it's a movie thing personally. Yes. So during all this uh, comedy stuff, we we also cut back to some of the police action going on because we're at the, the curtain... Arms Hole Hotel. We have Sparko and Rich. They go up with this other random cop. They go up to room 4E and they're looking for the dog guy. Because they got a hit on him. And they go up to him. They they trick him to let them in. Uh, Rich is the only one who knows how to speak Spanish. So he speaks Spanish to him. 
and he's basically trying to get like you know who the guy basically wouldn't really talk but he did say somebody hired him that's the only stuff they basically got out of him then the mom yeah. comes home kind of like freaked out everybody and the dog gets loose rich shoots the dog and then the our boy uh tries to jump out the window but then while he does that uh sparko shoots his ass down and then they look at it and I'm like oh fuck we kind of fucked up here he is kind of a clutch of fuck <laughs> yes i was like oh boy this thing the lieutenant's gonna say he's gonna have a fit now so now we're back at the comedy place Vern gets that phone call that we're still confused how she got the the phone call even though this is her first time here and nobody knows her name at all but they figured it out so she actually get a call from the killer the killer knows too she's at the comedy club too and he's all like hey you got about two minutes or I'm going to kill your friend Watson. You got to come outside. So Vern freaks out. She tries to find uh, Weeks, but he's too busy in the shitter before he goes on to his uh, performance. Oh, I'm glad we didn't miss that one. Oh, my God. I mean, Ooh, geez, yeah. Huh. I mean, might as well just shut the movie off. I mean, we're going to got to see his performance. So she's like, she can't find him. So she just leaves without him. And then she almost, basically, during this whole scene, she gets almost run over like three times from the killer. Mm. Watson shows up. She gets out of the, the, the taxi. I guess the killer yeah. was lying. So now she Got hugs him. Watson, and then they head up to the hospital. So now, after we find out they go to the hospital, now we're back with Mac, and they're doing a countdown. And he finally got Vern to be on uh, the show. Because he was about to be on the show last time, but she uh, I was misspoken. She didn't show up yet. So now this is, this is when she first shows up on his show now. Because I guess she was so freaked out by the killer. Her new plan is mm -hmm. to do the Mac plan. She is back on the Mac Express. She is. She's okay. all about Mac now. So she's talking about, you know, she saw these visions. She goes over the whole story of why she could see these visions. And then she eventually sees his light. And then she starts yeah. going into her clairvoyant stage of drawing. Yes. So she starts to draw. Weeks looks at the TV. He's like, oh, fuck. He's like, I shouldn't have, shouldn't have ate those nachos that night. So I was in the shitter. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then during all this, we could see that Watson, she gets kidnapped by the killer. So now, so now the uh, the Vern, she's crying after doing her paintings and stuff. And then out of nowhere, and this scene was weird, and I don't think they ever like talked about this one. Let's say, well, no, they kind of did. So Watson now is handcuffed to a car, and she's basically like spinning around in an abandoned garage. And then eventually, she spins out so much that the car. Dukes of Hazard style breaks out of a, a door, a, a, a blockade, and goes into the water. Yes. Very random. So now Weeks is mad at Mac. All right, telling him it ba Weeks is basically like you're you're kind of like explore you know you're you're putting her in danger. Okay, and. They found out that the Watson died. Okay. And Yeah. And they also say that the Weeks is also trying to get some police stuff out of uh, Vern too. But Vern or or Watson did not see the killer's face at all. Okay. And then eventually Mac is like, you know, saying like, "Hey, you know, I want you out of here and I don't want you to be around here at all." Like it's Weeks is fought on everything. And eventually, Vern, Weeks tells Vern, like, hey, you just need to pack up and get out of town. You know what I mean? Like, the killer probably knows who you are right now. You know, we don't know. We don't have any clues on him. It's probably best that you get out of here. And she refuses to do that. And then Weeks talks to Mac. And Weeks is like, listen, I don't want to do this. Because, you know, he doesn't really trust Mac because he just feels like me you know, Max Mac's ex exploiting her. You know what I mean? For his show. And he's part of the one that put her in the most danger. And then he's basically telling Mac, like, hey, at least if he, if she stays with you, at least I'll know where she's at. Mm. All right. 
Because, you know, she had my kid sister's eyes. So that turns me on. It, oh, fucking you're a weirdo. sick bastard. But fucking yes. weirdo. So, now, um, they, uh, now we see that uh, Burn is now going to, uh, she packed up all of her stuff at nighttime, of course, and the <laughs> the only thing that she brings to her, to Mac's house, we don't have a chair, pair of clothes, we don't have any no. nightgowns, we don't have any, no. you know, whatever you would do to, you know, like me, I gotta take like a whole bag, I gotta take my toothbrush, my contacts, yeah. solution and stuff, her, she just brings one outfit and then she brings all her drawings. Right. Well, I mean, she's all about um, her art. Yes, but I mean, fuck, you just, just, we just wear one outfit the whole time? I got you. I guess. She cares more about her art than she does clothing. Yes. So now, now Vern is showing Mac that she made a new drawing, and the new drawing has all the vic- victims together in one drawing. And then Mac is actually like, okay, well, Maybe what you could do is if you could try to maybe go deep in your brain and see if you can draw the killer's face. And while all of this is happening, Weeks is with a random police officer that we don't see in the film only for this scene. And he is trying to put all of Vern's drawings together to find more detailed clues. Because he can see that all of her paintings... They'll show like the killer's, um, you know, kill spot, but then she has close ups on everything too. Like some pictures are like a wide shot, and then some of them are a close up shot of the same killings. So he was trying to go find some more details of that. So eventually, Vern, she freaks out because her clairvoyance is acting up on her. And then Mac basically takes her to bed. All right. And while this is all happening, we still get back and forth motions with the guy with Weeks. And eventually, Vern looks at the painting while sipping some wine. And then when Vern is in Mac's room, she can see that Mac has a crab nightlight. I think this is weird. And I don't say that a lot, but I think this 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 whole thing is odd. Yeah. He has a nightlight. So, like, it's hard for me to describe what this thing is like because I kept seeing it in the movie. And I was like, oh, it's like, what the fuck is that? Yeah. But it is. It's like a globe. Globe, yeah. Nightlight with a crab on the top of it. Yeah. It's just fucking weird. So, yeah, like, she she did say that there was one painting in particular that was bothering her. And that was the one where she saw a bunch of flashing lights. Mm-hmm. And then there was one that had like something that looked like looked like the like a cr- a crab claw on there. So right, right when right. she sees the crab claw, Weeks looks at the uh, the painting with the crab claw, and he figures it out. He's like, "Wait a minute, I think that <laughs> Matt guy has that weird lamp in here in his room because you know every time I go to his apartment, which I've only been there once, I notice right away that he had a special lamp claw." Very, very uh, observant. It's our boy Weeks over here. So now, Vern knows that Weeks is, uh, you know, the uh, the killer. All right. And then we get a scene of Mac uh, staring deeply into the painting of all the people he basically killed, and now mm. we see the whole scene of why all these dudes died. And girl, <clears throat> if I may, if you you may, please. So the story is Mac had like some friends, which were the swimmer, Bird, mm-hmm. I believe his name was, the construction worker, and the sweaty guy. Okay, <laughs> and apparently yeah. they were in some sort of white guy cult of. Uh, a fucking uh, hookers and then killing them. Mm-hmm. All right. Or maybe this is one. So the story basically is that we find out that they just found Betty Mercer by chance. Okay. They found her out at a bar one day and I guess they convinced her to come back in the room and have some, uh, have some train ride action. If y'all know what I mean. 
So I think we do. So they they handcuff her to the bed. Then they mm-hmm. then they tie up the handcuffs. And at first she's into it, and then like not even a second later, she's like, "Wait a minute, maybe I shouldn't have done this." <laughs> and then we have like these like dudes with their shirt off, and one of them is so hairy. I'm like, "Come on, man!" Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> and then we we basically we see we see all the guys that died. You know, we see the swimmer that died for the in the swimming pool. We see the guy who died in the uh, the work accident. We see the guy yeah. who died by the elevator. They're all in that room, and then. The one main culprit who slides up the joy trail is going to be Mac. Of course. And, and he is the one that choked her basically out with the pillow while yeah. he was uh, while he was macking on her, if you know what I mean. If you, yeah, so Mac. we find out that Mac is the crazy killer. Mm-hmm. Okay. And he is the one who killed all the, uh, the guys to hide, to hide the murder. I guess so. They don't really, they don't like explain that part, but they basically, they kind of explain at the end a little bit, but that's basically what it is. So basically, Mac killed the girl just from his own devious sexual predator fantasies. And all the guy, he didn't want the guys to uh, squeal, I guess. So that's why he killed the swimming guy, he killed the sweaty guy, and he killed the uh, worker guy. Yeah. yeah. So I I find this well okay. The story that they're telling us makes sense. Yeah. But I find it weird that like so you're in like a society. Okay, like you're in a society with these people that that you're yeah. a group that does this thing. But then you all of a sudden you don't trust them, so you decide to kill all of them. Yeah. And I mean, it just, I don't not, know, it just seems That odd, one guy knew it, that sweaty guy knew it, because he hired that one hitman to kill mm. Mac, but that didn't work. So, that's why we were, it was basically for the plot for us to le- to believe that there could be multiple killers, but I knew who the killer was basically right away. So, after all this, Vern finds out, she tries to leave, she can't get out. She tricks Mac about seeing her go through the window because Mac wakes up when he wakes up from his fantasy thing of what he did he breaks the wine glass all over the picture and stuff and now he's trying to follow Vern uh, Vern gets out and she eventually runs to the rooftop like every like every uh, I think every like psychological thriller ends up on the rooftop you know what I mean? well yeah because because you could fall off and it's uh yes. It's a daring thing. So weeks, he's trying to rush through New York traffic. Good luck with that. And he does the thing that we talk about a lot, Allison. He gets stuck in traffic. He does. And he just leaves his car. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is shit is fantastic. Like, if we have any list, I mean, like, I've, I've spent a lot of time in New York City, but I've never oh, driven God. in New York City, and I never would. Yeah. But is that a thing that happens? Yeah, like, just leave the car. If you can't get somewhere, do you just leave your fucking car and then start running? Yeah. Like, the cops just typically leave their cars it's like, on oh, the there street to say, like, fuck it. Like, uh, mm. what, was it Maniac? Yeah, there's or a was, couple. Uh, there was a scene. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was where on, he can't um, get where he's g- <laughs> Yeah, it was, yeah, where he, like, he goes on the sidewalk and he, he stops his car and gets up there. <laughs> Yeah, it was maniac. It was maniac. Yeah, laughing. yeah. He pulls. He, he he's trying to get down the street, and he just pulls on the sidewalk. And says, "Fuck it, I'm just gonna walk from here." Yeah. <laughs> anyway, here we go. We're clairvoyant. Yeah. yeah so now Matt Weeks finally gets on. So now they're on the rooftop, right? And then Vern, she's going through all the sheets that kind of remind me of Halloween. You know, where you go through all yeah. the streets that are hanging out. I, I thought that too. Like I was yeah. like, that's the scene they took that directly from Halloween. So then uh, uh, Mac attacks her. Starts mm-hmm. choking her. All right. And like he's choking her for a good amount of time. And Weeks, oh, yeah. and Weeks gets there and he sees that uh, it looks like Vern got choked out by Mac. And then Mac starts attacking Weeks and they start having a brawl, if you can call it that. Mm-hmm. And then eventually they, they roll around on the roof. For yeah. A little bit. Eventually they do some more rolling around where they do like a whole like 360 or whatever and like freaking now. Weeks is holding Mac and, um, like, holding Mac, like, right off the roof, basically about to fall off. Like, holding him from falling off. And they're staring at each other. And Mac was like, just do it. Just let me go. And I was like, wait a minute, what? (laughs) 
he doesn't fit his character at all. And then Weeks looks at him, they look at each other, and then he just like drops him. And Weeks is like, Yeah, you're right, fuck you. Yeah, just fuck you. Drops just drops him onto the ass. sidewalk. And I love the scene of this falling uh uh cloth dummy. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, like it folds in half, folds like in it's half, so yeah. light. Like you can see it <laughs> fold in half. I'm like, holy shit. Like, yes. could he not put another dollar or two into that and like made it a little bit more <laughs> sturdy? <Yes. laughs> it was fantastic. And then Weeks checks on Vern. She's okay. She's fine. Just a little choking. It's okay. <laughs> and then She's they fine. and then they get they get down, all the cops, all the rest of the crew shows up. Lieutenant Collins like you're telling me this Mac guy went out there and killed all his posse that he was with. And he killed out this Betty girl. It doesn't make any sense. None of it makes any doesn't sense. doesn't make any sense. And Rich is like, Rich is like, the fuck you talk about, man? Everything makes sense. <laughs> it makes perfect sense. <laughs> it makes perfect sense. And then Mac's like, he's like, Colin's like, touching his fingers like, oh yeah. Yeah, man, yeah. There we go. Okay, good job. <laughs> I was like, what? what is going on here? <laughs> and then Weeks and and Vern leave and reporter from Channel 6 is there and mm-hmm. Weeks is like, oh, are you from Channel 6? He's like, yeah. And then he does some impression saying, <laughs> good night, everybody. And then they fucking leave all happy. I'm like, what? It's so what weird. What a weird ass ending. I was like, first of all, Mac, I already knew he was the fucking killer from right when he showed up on the fucking screen. You could just tell. Yeah. Yeah, you could just tell. And I did, like the problem is they they I think I the thing that they didn't uh push on, which I thought they should have mo- a little bit more, was when yeah. Mac was killing his uh 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 uh, uh raper group. Okay. Mm-hmm. Not only was he killing them to to raper group. Yeah, to not <laughs> To not like, uh, you know, to not expose him, but he's also doing yeah. it to make himself famous too, because he basically created himself like an own serial killer. I mean, the the idea right. is actually pretty uh, good when it comes to yeah, Max's character, yeah, you're right. because yeah. he was killing these guys. Not only was he hiding up his own, you know, deed of what he did to this uh, prostitute, but he mm-hmm. was also at the same time making his career because he was the main uh, talking point of this murder is that all these murders that he was creating and he was doing it to get himself famous. Yes. But I didn't really get why he like, like, like why? Well, I, okay. So there were some parts of like, Oh, he, he was probably trying to keep Vern tight close to him because he knew that she was like exposing all his murders in detail, but he was trying to use her in that way. But I feel like he could have, like he, he, like I don't know. It just really, he tried to kill her, but it didn't work. But he got like her friends. And st- I don't know why he couldn't actually kill Vern. You know what I mean? Like I don't know. He had so many opportunities to do it, and he just didn't do it. Really, very interesting. So, but yeah, like his. Uh, I thought his uh, his take on because I feel like in the movie they they were saying like, well, he was just killing these guys to hide his ass. But I think he was doing that for that reason, but he was also doing it because he was trying to get famous as well, too, by creating uh, uh, a serial killer, basically. Yes. Which was a hot topic because they kept talking about how the Son of Sam was so close to this, and obviously that was a big news story at the time, so he was trying to create himself like his own murderer. Which is, I think if they played more of that on this movie, I think it would have, like, flowed a lot better. So... What do you think, Allison? Yeah, I mean, I don't think the movie was bad. It was just okay. Yeah. Like, if we just had gone to the theater to see this, I would have walked out of it saying, oh, okay, it was all right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but it was better when I watched it a second time, though. Um, so, uh, it's fine. Um, I mean, I like uh, D- um, uh, Master Oyani's other movies better, for sure. Um, but, you know, this is not a bad movie. Yeah. It's not bad. But everybody, join us here next week on The Retro Blood. Yeah. As we finish up this killer New York month. Talking all about cruising. I know. This is... Uh, 
crime. Screws in. Have you ever seen this movie before? Have I have not. This, this is a, so this is like a big time movie, if you will. Like yeah. this is not our little low budget movies. Cause you know, we do, uh, we do low budget movies. We do high budget movies. We do uh, no budget movies. This is a high budget movie. This has yeah. Al Pacino in it. Al Pacino as a bro. real actor. As a real actor. Who wasn't, who wasn't in a porn movie. Yes. <laughs> before he was in the movie we're talking about. So it says Al Pacino. It's about a serial killer. So this is going to be, uh, it's going to be good. Be wild stuff, man. Bruising. Yeah. We have some New York City gay club action going on here. It's going to be yep. wild stuff. Yep. Yep. Fantastic. So. But join us there. And then, of course, on that episode, we would talk about our full schedule for, for the month of October, which is going to be yeah, a wild that's gonna month. Be, that's going to be fucking wild. But yeah, Andres, thank you for uh, recommending New York City Month because we, uh, uh, something I wanted to do personally for a while and was trying to sell James here on. So thank you for pushing that over the edge. And I promise you, unless we die or quit the show, we will do Basket Case. And we will do Chud at some point. Yes. I promise you. Promise you. We have plans for those. Yes, we have plans of those. Those would be pretty fun. I can't wait. Mm-hmm. But everybody, make sure when you're trying to get your career going, has a uh, Channel 6 newscaster. Yeah. Just make sure, you know, if you're going to be doing crimes and stuff, you know, just make sure they get your uh, the beauty shot on there. Yeah, especially if mm-hmm. you're in a club of a club of rapists. Yes. If you <laughs> if you have a if you if you if you run a rapist club, make yeah. sure that you uh, stay clean in yeah. every other aspect. Yeah. I mean, come on now. What a weird fucking thing. But yeah, fucking anyway. Weird. <laughs> fucking weird, dude, man. They're wild over there in New York, man. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But anyway, New York. Yeah. Jay Austin, James Kahn. We'll see you all next week. We're cruising. See y'all later. See you guys.